Wheel of Genre, the show for people suddenly questioning whether it's morally okay to kill houseflies. We just started a new series where we are reading all the short stories in Harlan Ellison's anthology called Dangerous Visions. I'm Zach, and this week I'm really interested in the, oh, I don't know, the kind of ethical culpability of Cassidy. Uh, how responsible is he for his actions? How much is he just kind of like a robot automaton, a toy that's been set off to, to do the bidding of others? Or how much is he really relishing in his role in the story? I'm Bob, and this week I'm interested in the Golden Ones. Why are they sending Cassidy out there? What do they want from him, and what do they want from humanity? Are they just cruel bastards. Robert Silverberg is a heavy hitter, a huge sci-fi author, and I just hear his name all the time, but as a big noob, I've never read him. But I'm so interested in him, especially in this collection. We talked last episode about Harlan Ellison wanting to get these dangerous visions going, getting a new uh, voice for this new wave of sci-fi. And I think Robert Silverberg is interesting. He is also kind of a transitional author who starts in the golden age, and then transitions into New Wave and becomes, I think, more famous. Well, maybe not, but he, be, he writes lots of famous stories in the New Wave era. But he's also in that kind of transitional period where lots of these um, pulp magazines or science fiction magazines are having problems. Some go bankrupt, some are having a hard time publishing anything. So he transitions into writing all sorts of different genres. And I think he writes, what, yeah, 200, 200 erotic novels in the space of a few years. This guy is one of the most prolific authors, at least sci-fi authors of all time. Yeah, I was floating around his bibliography on Wikipedia and there was a ton of stuff that, you know, I've just never heard of according to what I was reading. This guy was writing over 50,000 words a week. This guy was a machine. Uh, and the way that Harlan Ellison spins it is really the... I don't know, like the timeless contrast between, you know, what you would call like uh, the organized, uh, calculating, uh, highly productive individual and the genius. Um, a lot of people say that in order to be a genius or like the stereotype for a genius is something along the lines of like someone who kind of idles about daydreams. And then one day it's like click. Uh, they have this beautiful work of art or new theory or work of literature like ready formed in, in their head. But what Harlan Ellison describes with Silverberg is this idea that no, he is a genius, but he became a genius through working constantly, through having like this regimen, through uh, constantly outputting different works in different genres and being a really like a workhorse, a, consum a consummate professional. So absolutely prolific author, very interesting author here. I want to ask you, what do you think about the themes of this story? This is exciting to read Dangerous Visions, especially when, what is it, I think a month from now, the new Dangerous Visions comes out and it's been, you know, set to publish for almost 30, 30 years, I think. And it's coming out October 1st, 2024. And it's this an anthology just like this, but... It's one that just kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed, and finally it's coming out. So it's very exciting. But last week we said that maybe the first story is kind of an uh, introduction to the new wave, you know, saying goodbye to the giants of Golden Age sci-fi and saying, okay, this is going to be our new style. This, in its cruelty, in its violence, what do you think? What, what does this represent to you in a gap between Golden Age and new wave? That's a really good question. Uh, I think that, you know, when I think of like the, you know, early types of science fiction that are a little bit more pulpy, a little bit more, you know, the kind of like boys adventure stories, but set in the future or in space or with ray guns, or with Martians, things like that. They're very tame. They're very calm and they're very straightforward in terms of plot and pacing. This one, I think that what we get is immense amounts of cruelty packed into a very short story. And I think that what makes this so tonally different than uh, these older, you know, more golden age types of science fiction is that it doesn't necessarily end on a optimistic or feel good or hopeful note. 
actually it ends on uh, a very bleak note, a very uh, cosmically pessimistic note. But before we dive into that, I think that maybe we need to rewind just a second and talk about exactly what happened in this story. So we have a man named Cassidy, and we're just first asked to look at him. And he has uh, almost no body left. There was some sort of explosion, and it says, uh, this is what he has left, a brain box, a few ropes of nerves, a limb. So he's almost nothing. <laughs> and then he ends up with these, I have a question for you about these people later, but he ends up uh, being put back together by this race or these people or whoever they are called the Golden Ones. Then they also tell him, oh, we fixed a few things. In fact, we've made you a little bit more in touch with the emotions of your fellow beings. So Cassidy says, okay, well, I'm gonna go back home. And this guy has been married, how long, how many times did it say? Three Dozens times. Of times. Yeah. Only three? Okay, okay. Only three, So yeah. he goes. Okay, so he goes back and visits each wife. And then we see this this cruelty, this this long... Actually, reminds me a lot of Faust when we read Faust. Him doing terrible things uh, one after the other. What, what does he do in these things? What does he do in these scenes, Zach? Well, I mean, he... So first off, he finds the location of all of his ex-wives. He goes to the first one and learns that she is a recovering drug addict. So first, you know, he he reconnects with her emotionally, but then he goes out and he buys more drugs for her. And she goes, no, not more drugs. And then in that moment of like despair and anguish before she takes, you know, before she relapses into drug use, he seems to channel her emotions and broadcast them to the golden ones, the, the very people who put him back together for this purpose. Next, he goes to um, the second ex-wife, uh, who he describes as the smart one, who always valued comfort. And there she has, it's not a dog, but it's a dog. You know, it's one of those sci-fi <laughs> things. It's not a, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a dog. It's a many-eyed we'll purple dog. Yeah. dog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, he even says... So what he does basically is he kills it in front of her. And, you know, then once again, he, you know, he takes the anguish and the horror of this person and broadcasts it up to the golden ones. And he goes to his third wife who is pregnant now. And it's not with a husband. She's been uh, doing in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination, you know, and she's finally pregnant and about to have a baby two months away from this baby being born. And uh, he, he, this time is slightly different. He tells her what he's going to do. And she calls him insane. You're insane. And then he kicks her in the stomach a few times. Not enough to kill the baby, but uh, to, to disrupt the process for sure. Uh, broadcasts the pain up. And then this is where the story kind of takes a turn because the golden ones decide that uh, ultimately what he's doing isn't working for them. We can talk about why it's not working for them later, but it's not working. So they, I guess you could say they recall him in the same way that you would recall, oh, you know, a defective television. They bring him back to the factory and they change the way he's functioning so that now he feels guilt. He's aware of, of the, the horribleness of everything he's done. And now instead of the golden one's kind of relishing on the pain and suffering of all these people that Cassidy, God, I want to call him Cassidy, Cassidy uh, is causing, they now relish and experience the suffering of Cassidy and his guilt over everything that he's done. The Golden Ones, you just said we can talk about the Golden Ones or why they decide to take that away. I think it's so interesting that they say you've become too much like us. Or, you know, you're doing what we do and it's not for you to do. So that's why they have to adjust him. When they take him up, they're going to adjust him. And they say that they put his, quote, they turn his perceptions inward. So he is like a vulture tearing out his entrails. That's how they get their new data. I think it's interesting that in Golden Age sci-fi, like you said, it's often boys' adventures. And, you know, sometimes good conquers evil, at least most of the time in those boys' adventures. Of course, not in Lord of the Flies. But... In the other ones, 
um, some arbiter of justice comes down and puts things back in order. Here, we have these golden ones who are almost, you know, in the last story we had God, these golden ones feel kind of angelic because they don't seem to be in any part of the world. They're out somewhere else. They have access. They can do anything to his body they want, and they just want data. They're completely outside the society, aliens, whatever they are. And if they are the highest power in this story, you know, they're sending him out to go and get cruelty. And then if he's doing cruelty, they can be the ones to bring him to justice and, you know, tweak him and say, look, you can't be doing this. But they just make it even worse and they enjoy to see even more cruelty. So it's interesting to go from golden age now to new wave where our higher power or our most powerful people who kind of reign supreme throughout the story, throughout the arc of the story, are purposely cruel, purposefully cruel. Yeah, purposely cruel. And, you know, it's never about morality for them. I, I think that in a way they recall kind of the elder gods of like H.P. Lovecraft, these cosmic beings Though I suppose I would contrast it with the beings of, Lo of the Lovecraftian universe by pointing out how in Lovecraft, those beings seem to always want to harm humanity, want to cause mm. humanity pain. Here, and I'll read a quote, the Golden Ones have this to say. They made some changes in the template. They're talking about Cassidy's kind of mental schema. Of course, they were craftsmen, and there was a good deal they wanted to learn. So it seems like... They don't have like a positive or negative moral mission with humanity. They It seems like they're fundamentally motivated by curiosity. In a weird way, they want to learn about human experience. I don't think that it, that necessarily means from the get-go, though, that they wanted to learn about negative human experience, though. I think that it's—I hate to be like, oh, it's all just a misunderstanding— but I think they wanted to learn about any human experience. And Cassidy, Cassidy has a quote here that I think demonstrates that from his position, he isn't entirely sure about what they want. I'll read that quote now. So to set the scene, he's in front of the third wife and he's telling her what he's going to do to her baby. And this is what he says. I feel your fear. You think I'm going to do something to your baby. Fear is of no interest, Laureen, but sorrow, yes, that's worth analyzing. Desolation. I want to study it. I want to help them study it. I think that's what they want to know about. Don't run from me, Laureen. So we get a couple, we get a couple emotions there. So he says, fear, not of interest, sorrow and desolation. That's worth analyzing. And the key word there is analyzing. But he says, I think that's what they want to know about. And that think right there is a big question mark hanging over everything. And that explains why they ultimately reprogram him. Because he ultimately doesn't know what they want. And as we learn, what he's doing to other people isn't exactly what they set out to do. Uh, he's a wind-up toy that was set in the wrong direction. He's uh, fundamentally broken, mislaid. I'm going to push back on this. I think you're right that he is, you know, they've, they've made a mistake and they want to fix him. They want to tune him up. However, I do think they are sending him out to do these cruel things, to perpetrate desolation and cruelty so they can study that. And even though he doesn't quite get what they're going for, we do get some sort of, Silverberg gives us a slight explanation, a hint when he says um, he did these things joylessly, this joyless cruelty that he does against his wives. And it says that he has to be changed because, quote, for he partook too deeply of the nature of the golden ones themselves. So I think that they are these beings who want to do cruelty, but now somehow he's getting too close to their power. I think it's not that they're upset that he's being cruel and they say, oh no, we've made a monster. I think they wanted to make a monster, but he's coming too close to the light. He's coming too close to seeing how to make a monster. Well, I, 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 do, I do agree with you on the importance of that line, though I do, I, do, I do wonder if that line is meant more to illuminate the nature of the Golden Ones as being fundamentally monstrous themselves. You know, the same way that a cat would play, you know, kind of torment a mouse before it kills it. Uh, that's their nature. But 
I don't know, when it says that he gets too close to their nature, it almost makes it seem like they don't intend for him to become that. He just happenstance ends up being like them. And that could be entirely beside the question of what they want. Maybe they do want pain. Maybe they do want suffering. And that's why ultimately they leave him with full knowledge and awareness of what he's done. And, and they just get a single person transfer of guilt for as long as, as they wish to relish in that feeling. Is it guilt or is it just more pain? I believe it's guilt. Uh, let's look at the final mm. lines in this book. All right, this is a bit of a long quote, but bear with me now. Within the glowing sphere of golden light, they made their adjustments on him. They entered him and altered him and turned his perceptions inward so that he might feed on his own misery like a vulture tearing at its entrails. That would be informative. Cassidy objected until he no longer had the power to object, and when his awareness returned, it was too late to object. No, he murmured. In the yellow gleam, he saw the faces of Beryl and Mirabelle and Lorene. You shouldn't have done this to me. You're torturing me like you would a fly. There was no response. They sent him away back to Earth. They returned him to the travertine towers and the rumbling slidewalks, to the house of pleasure on 485th Street, to the islands of light that blazed in the sky, to the 11 billion people. They turned him loose to go among them and suffer and report on his sufferings. And a time would come when they would release him, but not yet. Here is Cassidy, nailed to his cross. So if... if we take them at his word that he sees the faces of these people that he's hurt before and he has full awareness and he's like a vulture tearing in its entrails and he's described as nailed to his cross. I, I personally don't know what, how I could characterize that feeling and that emotion in any way other than guilt. So if he's seeing the faces of the people that he's killed or at least hurt in this case and some guilt, then he's also feeling that I guess it has to be guilt. It can't just be physical pain. It sounds like they, they turn him in on himself. You know, they could be putting in more pain because they do somehow enter him, they say, and change his wiring. So it sounds like it could be, you know, a nervous system change. So they are just jolting him with um, pain from seeing this, but it is basically the same thing as guilt. But what do you think? Like, what is the point of this? Are they teaching him to be guilty when he wasn't before? He see, we don't know what he's like before this, just now he's suddenly cruel and it's they have made him that cruel and now they want to fix that and give him guilt back. So is it just their mistake and they have to correct their mistake? I don't, I don't see it as correction or guilt for the sake of guilt. I think it's, um, you know, before I guess you could say they were kind of slurping up the pain and anguish of the people who he was causing pain and anguish to. It seems like now, instead of using him as a conduit, they're using him as a source. That's that's what I read into it. What do, what do you think? What was your reading on that? Oh, you're right. I'm just curious. Like, do they care that they're... I guess, what do they think about this guilt? Do they have guilt too? Are they upset that he is killing other people? Or is it just more efficient to now have him um, to see this anguish, to, to watch guilt? Is it just better data? I mean, like you said, they're not exactly moral characters. They seem to be outside of morality and they're just curious. But it's interesting that why don't they come down and, you know, give pain to people? We don't see them come down. They're, they're totally outside of reality or outside of this plane of existence. So they need him at first as a conduit, now as a source. It's just interesting that they want something, they cause pain, they get their data, and that data is all about cruelty. There's no moral lesson in this guilt, I guess. It's just guilt for pain. You know, there's a really interesting description uh, when he's broadcasting the pain of others. And it's the, that pain is described as the exquisite intensity. And that adjective, exquisite, really got me thinking about what's going on here because... You know, he's he's sharing these experiences with the golden ones, but who is describing it as exquisite here? 
Is it exquisite to him or is it exquisite to the golden ones? And and what does it mean if the answer is both? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. What, what, what do you make of that? Because it doesn't seem clear to me. Doesn't seem clear to me either. Yeah. If, if he is operating as their puppet, I guess he might uh, experience things the way they want him to. So it's probably exquisite to him, exquisite to them. But I'm interested in the the end, the afterward. You know, the way Harlan Ellison set this up was the writers send him the story, and if they're if he's going to publish it, they send him an afterward too to explain why they think their story fits with dangerous visions, why they think it is a dangerous vision. And he says he compares the story to vampirism and cannibalism, and he says, "Am I just writing about vampirism and cannibalism? Maybe so." And he says, quote, beneath any grotesquerie lies its opposite. Behind the grimness of cannibalism lies the video sentimentality. People need people to devour, if nothing else. So he likes this idea of devouring people or just sucking the blood out of someone or sucking away their guilt just to make more guilt and more pain. There's no, it's like there's no uh, end to this. It's just a means to... Pain, it's pain for its pain's sake. And he, at the end of that afterward too, he says, yes, I've done this. I've written about cannibalism or vampirism. Then he says, no apologies offered, no excuses, just a story, a made up fiction, a fantasy about future times and other worlds, nothing more than that. It sounds very different from golden age fiction where we said it is a boy's adventure story and right comes to rule, or at least, uh, some sort of justice comes in at the end. But here it's a story just to have cruelty for cruelty's sake. And it feels very different from older sci-fi that we've read. Well, so for, for our audio podcast, we are we just finished reading an entire horror selection, including, do we do two vampire stories this time? We've done Bram Stoker's Dracula in the past, and we just read uh, Le Fanu's Carmilla. And that afterward got me thinking, what, what does he mean here when he talks about vampirism? Like, do you feel like when he makes that connection, do you feel like it has made the connection of vampirism has made this story more meaningful? Or do you feel like it added something to your understanding of these vampire stories we've already read? How do you fit this knowledge together that that this was his intention and this was the author's own interpretation of what's going on here? I think it's very different from Carmilla where we have that kind of excessive love, that devotion. Here it is just joyless. He just goes, joylessly kills, and just causes more pain. Uh, it's a vampire that doesn't want anything. It's just propelled to do bad things. There's no desire at all. Yeah, desire is really the fundamental, um, what would we call that, noun? <laughs> the fundamental <laughs> noun that characterizes the vampire. But it is ultimately desire that can be satiated, right? Like it's, it's a desire that the vampire drinks blood and then the vampire rests. You know what I mean? Oh, but like any desire, desire returns and needs to be satiated again. Uh, there's no, there's in vampire stories in any story, there's no such thing as a permanent satiation of desire. Where the connection to vampirism breaks down with this story, you know, to build off what you're saying is, I don't get any sense that this person feels desire. This person is a robot. This person is. You know what? It's he's an addict. He is an addict mm. for these experiences and perhaps like the 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 act of violence for what it brings to him. I don't get the sense that um, killing the space dog did anything for him other than like a momentary uh, glimpse of pleasure. But there's no satiation. So I don't know. It's it's a different kind of vampire that I think I'm familiar with, but I'm willing to entertain the author nonetheless. It's a very vacuous vampire. Uh, I think we've kind of gone full circle here. When we were reading these Gothic fiction stories, especially Frankenstein, it's all about life, trying to devour life. Same with the vampires. It's all about the sublime and living, not living life to its fullest, but trying to 
go to the edges of the earth and have these awesome experiences where you see giant mountainscape, you know, you see terrible oceans, uh, monsters that you can't explain, terrible things from the shadows. And it's all about going into that terror to feel the sublimity, to, to feel life uh, brimming over. And then to we ultimately have, you know, Frank conquer death. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, to conquer the sublime and to conquer death in these old romantic stories. I mean, you know, uh, as evidenced by someone like uh, Frankenstein or Goethe, you know, but go on. I just had to, you know. Now that's very interesting, actually, because I'm now wondering, do the authors want to conquer death or are they giving us cautionary tales against conquering death? There seems to be, you know, they go hand in hand, death and life, because the sublime is the threat of death because you're seeing too much life at once or you're just going too far. I'm not sure, I guess, what the authors are doing there. But for that romantic poetry, you know, it's going further than you really should go. Yeah. But a vampire, like you said, they can satiate that desire because they put their teeth into it and they, they drink the blood. You know, it is going too far and they can actually live it. Here we have a vampire that has no emotion at all. And if the romantics were trying to escape that Victorian science where it is rational and everything can be explained and we go to the ends of the earth to overturn every stone because we're going to put it all in a grid. We're going to understand everything. Here we have this automaton, this robotic vampire that's, if, if a vampire has come out of romanticism, it's turned away from romanticism and become empty again. But in the Victorian age where science looks very positive and we're going to, I don't know, do good things with it, here there's no meaning behind it that we can find. There's no joy behind it. He doesn't get pleasure when he kills the dog. He just does it. It's just his impulse. He is a drug addict. It's like a new drug addict science in this uh, in the second story of Dangerous Visions. So new wave science fiction, it seems to be a big threat to golden age science fiction. I'm not sure. Gosh, I... <laughs> You know, we've read Golden Age science fiction before, but the 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 titles we've read, I don't want to say they're scattered, but they are, we've skimmed the fat from the top and we've enjoyed it. <laughs> but there's, I, I'm personally not comfortable yet making any broad sweeping statements, but I have a feeling that as we continue through this anthology and get a much better sense of what makes the new age, even though, you know, I I have a pretty good idea at this point, but it, it all feels, it feels like new territory. And I, I think that, I think that this might be a good moment to bring up style. Uh, mm. One of the things that I, I keep reading about Robert Silverberg is that he went to, uh, was it Columbia? Basically, he, he, you know, he, this is one of the few authors who gets into like an Ivy League school for literature. And he's out there reading modernist fiction. And then he graduates and he comes back and, you know, continues publishing in science fiction. And I think the idea is that he's taking a lot of the themes he learned and, and a lot of the, the, the styles and techniques and, um, allowing that to feed his creativity. Um, that, you know, I mean, you know, I guess it's a open debate on <laughs> how effective that influence was. Could, could you detect it in this or it was, did it, did it feel like it was doing something else? I think you're right. It is a big, I think he is bringing this literary darkness uh, into science fiction. Of course, it could have been there too, but it seems to be very present here. You know, we worked with a great bookseller uh, in Portland, Nate, who always said, oh, I hate reading literary fiction because it's all about suicide or affairs. I just want to read genre fiction. And it feels like Silverberg is taking like these really dark, terrible, um, not even dark night of the soul, just pessimistic uh, notion these pessimistic ideas and putting them into science fiction shaking it up a little bit but also i don't know kind of messing with messing with the feeling of golden age sci-fi i guess we haven't read that much but brent from the hugo knots i love the way he has defined it and they've read everything so i can trust brent brent says you know golden <laughs> age sci-fi is all about 
hey, we have a problem. We're going to use science to solve it. And then everyone kind of claps and we've all done a good job and we can move on. We've avoid, you know, we've destroyed the meteor that was going to kill us. Or we've built a, an amazing city that um, will never die. It's extremely positive. And here, not only does bad thing, not only do bad things happen, but the forces behind it are themselves bad. It is very Lovecraftian. You know, they're out to get us and they're just going to make us suffer for no reason except to see us suffer. I think this is a good time to really bring up the uh, the moment that lends the story its title and what seems to be either the moment of inspiration for writing the story or maybe something that was just kind of backwards applied. He found the quote and said, hey, that's a good, that, that will illuminate my story <laughs> or the point I'm trying to tell. But it's a reference to Shakespeare, specifically the play uh, King Lear, which we have not read together. For viewers, listeners who don't know, Bob and I are reading all the Shakespeare plays right now. We haven't gotten to King, uh, King Lear yet, but this is a wonderful preview for us. But here's, here's a quote as it appears in this story. Tell me the line from Shakespeare, Mirabelle, about the flies, the flies and the wanton boys. Her furrows sprouted in her pale brow. It's from Lear, she said. Wait, yes. Quote, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. They kill us for their sport. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. So we're the flies and the gods are our little bastard boys and they're killing us for sport. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think the... You know, the obvious comparison here is the golden ones being the gods who are treating humanity like flies. Though it is interesting what he says in this very scene. He says to her, I have become a god. And this line troubled me. Uh, and, you know, after our last conversation, it may seem like a theological thing, but it's not. I promise. I just want to know what... <laughs> he meant by that to you how did you interpret that line when how does he see himself when he says he has become a god what does that mean what does he mean there i think that still goes back to well what, i think he thinks that he is a god because you know he's met the gods whatever they are and he's doing their business and he has powers that he's never had before you know also he's been reborn like he was a brain box and a limb and a few nerves, he, he was dead. He was resurrected. So he's been brought, Ooh. he's been resurrected. <laughs> and I think it goes back to that, and he's put on the cross at the end. But it goes back to that line earlier when they say he had become too close to us. You know, he gets yeah. too close to the gods. He, they make him his messenger, and he thinks, I am a god. That his actions are not only the hand of God, I guess he then believes it's his own hand. I mean, he, he, he becomes not only the symbol of their power, but in his mind, their power as well. And I think that crosses a line. In the last story, we saw God being chased by his own creation, the usurpers. And the usurpers tell him, look, God, God, get out. You're profane, and this is a sacred place. And God <laughs> says, what? <laughs> I, yeah. I, made, I made this place. It's just it's shocking. And here we have these gods who... Just come in, mess with this guy, and then they tell him, okay, you're, you're crossing over, um, and it's a violation. So we need to stop that violation. You're not one of us. Get out. That's what it feels like. Yeah. I don't know what it is. You know, just thinking back to a lot of the examples of, you know, new wave science fiction. New wave? New age. Oh, boy. I'm in trouble. New I can't even remember the new <laughs> wave. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so many of them are really, um, interested in kind of spiritual realities more than scientific realities. Thinking of people like Philip K. Dick, thinking of actually his collaboration with, uh, Zelazny, Deus Irai, which was, a you know, the God of Wrath, a great book we read. Um, and, and then these last two stories, which, you know, we're, we're lumping in with the, the New Wave project, all of them have to do with kind of spins on religion and spiritual realities. 
I mean, I had a professor of religious studies once say to me that he teaches Philip K. Dick in his Gnosticism course. Uh, my point being that I, I feel I, I am curious to see as we move through this anthology whether we're sticking to the religion theme or whether we will move on to other topics in this uh, movement of speculative fiction. What direction will it go? I'm very interested to see that too. Is there going to be more overturnings of uh, what we think is morality too? And is there going to be more mistrust in gods? We'll see. Onward. Hey, uh, we have a audio podcast that you can find on Spotify, the YouTube, the Apple. Uh, basically what we do is we take a different genre of books every month or so, and we switch it up. We spin the wheel, the wheel of genre, and land on a different one each time. So that could be spy books, mysteries, romances, horror. Basically, we're reading four or five and just talking about it. Every conversation builds on the other. If you like the show, um, hit subscribe, leave us a rating. All that stuff helps. And uh, check out our Patreon. We already mentioned we're doing really fun stuff with Shakespeare on it right now. Talk to you later, Bob. Talk to you later, Zach.